Hello everyone. Thank you for tuning in to our virtual presentation. We really appreciate the chance to share what we've been working on. So my name is Nate and I'll be taking you through the drivetrain design for this vehicle. So we are attempting to do a four-wheel drive transition this year. For this presentation though, I'll be taking you through specifically how that affected the drivetrain for this vehicle and also some other changes we made just from our experiences and races in the past. So I'll be talking about just the justification for four-wheel drive, as well as our implementation and design of a transfer case, as well as a front and rear differential, and just some general specs as well. So first off, why, why four-wheel drive? Well, a few years ago, we had one of our team members design a really solid gearbox. Prior to that, we had a lot of issues with failures of our transmission systems. And because of that, we were always very hesitant after having this newfound success to really bridge out and push the envelope. However, when SAE released this new rule, you'll see on the screen, uh, at the beginning of last season, we kind of reflected on ourselves as a team and we found that we had stagnated in the drivetrain department and that we were really up for the challenge and that we really agreed with what SAE was saying and that the two-wheel drive models had become, were becoming obsolete. And the 150 bonus points at competition was also a big benefit. So a couple of key changes that I wanna talk about that were directly related to the transition to, to four-wheel drive. There was a 90 degree rotation of the engine. So the output shaft of the engine actually faces toward the firewall, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. We also incorporated a drive shaft, obviously, to power the front wheels, and that's a through chassis drive shaft with a steel rotational energy protection to protect the driver. We designed a new transfer case, and we incorporated some differentials and we also designed some new hubs to accommodate four-wheel drive, and we increased the fixed reduction in our gears. And some things that did not change is that we're still using a continuously variable transmission, and we still have independent rear suspension in the front and rear, there's no solid axle. So just a general overview of the vehicle before I can really get into some of the specifics of the drivetrain, I just wanted to provide an image of what, what our vehicle will look like. In the car, you'll see our body scan avatar, this was based on one of our larger drivers, so this is what a larger person would look inside the vehicle with respect to the drivetrain and the other components. So now looking at the drive line, specifically the drive shaft, it might look a little bit, a little bit squiggly to start, and that has to do with our, the front differential you see on the right side of the right picture. That's a Polaris uh, Sportsman 450 front differential. We acquired that at a discount through Polaris' sponsorship program and it had the reduction we want on a vehicle that was similar to a Baja car and it has electronically locking capabilities, meaning we have true four-wheel drive we can toggle when the front wheels are powered. Now, obviously, to use that, we had to take a bit of a detour in our drive line. So our drive shaft is composed of two separate shafts and four CV joints, as well as some 4340 chromoly spline couplers. And then a, the carrier bearing is a linear ball bearing, so it provides stability about the vertical axis. So if anything were to come loose, it would protect the driver and nothing would go flying. Moving on to the transfer case, it is a three gear single reduction uh, gearbox with a ratio of 3.14. It uses 9310 through hardened gears, which is the exact same specs as the previous gearbox I discussed before. So it's, you know, it's battle tested. We know it works and we know our, our calculations back it up well. And the housing will be aluminum manufactured in-house. I just wanted to show how efficiently everything is packed in the rear with this image here. You can see the transfer case highlighted in gold is packed between the uh, CVT case and the engine, and it kind of scissors itself nicely between, or between the two to align itself with the center of the vehicle. Looking at the differentials, we have the, for the rear we have a Yamaha Grizzly with a 6.7 reduction, and for the front differential, as I mentioned, is a Polaris Sportsman with, that is electronically locking, so a driver can just flip the switch and four wheel drive will be on or off. And then we also have, that has a reduction of 3.18. Now you probably already know that that is not the same reduction. And to correct for that, we are using larger tires in the rear. And this has a dual effect of both fixing the reduction and it also increases the traction in the rear having larger tires. And then lastly, looking at some general specs comparing our previous car to this year's car, you'll see that we had a high reduction of 7.43 and a low reduction of 33.1 and that resulted in a theoretical top speed of 33 miles per hour and a torque from theoretical torque from rest of 290 foot-pounds. And then looking at the current model, it has a high reduction of 8.99 and a low reduction of 38.9. You'll see the theoretical top speed is 27 miles per hour with a theoretical torque from rest of 350 foot-pounds. This is based on experience from previous races. We found that acceleration and torque were much more desirable characteristics to have in competition. 
it's very rare that you ever reach top speed and when you do it's not for a very long duration so it doesn't give you a, a real competitive edge however torque and acceleration are important factors to have in every aspect of the competition hi my name is Zachary Rivers and I'll be going over the suspension system for the design overview I'll be going over the uprights the hubs the trailing arms the additive manufacturing that we just started this year and then the validation plan we have for testing our suspension system for the 2019 uprights we had to use multiple designs one for the left side of the car and one for the right side of the car for the 2021 car we had to accommodate for the four-wheel drive so to make it easier on ourselves we decided to make the uprights interchangeable so they can be used on any wheels for the hubs, we had a simple design for the 2019, but we had to accommodate for the four wheel drives. So showing on the right side, you can see our new design. For the 2019 trailing arms, we used streamlined tubing, and this gave us an inaccurate geometry due to the shape, and when it was hard to manufacture the fittings to fit inside properly. For the 2021 trailing arms, we decided to go with a simpler design and we decided to use round steel tubing. This allowed us less time to manufacture. We also used thicker hinds to account for the larger bending force found at the pivot of the trailing arms. This year we decided to do some more additive manufacturing. This was to save material costs, save time, and uh, also make prototypes. For the cost efficient, we didn't have to go through as much aluminum to make each prototype. We were able to just use PLA filament. This also saved on time because we didn't have to have somebody watching or running the CNC machine because for 3D printing, you can just leave it alone and it will just 3D print by itself. For the front suspension of the vehicle, we utilized a dual offset non-parallel A-arm system. This allows for a 3.58 degree change over the 11.52 inch wheel trim. At ride height, the front system has zero degrees of tow with, a, with up to three degrees of negative adjustment avail, available for tuning. The rear suspension employs a semi trailing arm system composed of a single trailing link from the frame to the bearing carrier. The rear has 7.6 degree of tow change over the system 11.52 inch travel. For the validation plan for the suspension system, we plan on doing three major tests. The first test would be uh, three preliminary five foot drop tests, one unweighted, one weighted, and then one with a driver. The next test would be a full four hour long endurance practice. And then the last test would be 10 sets of five lap runs around our test track. This will allow us to troubleshoot the suspension system and also match measured body roll to theoretical body roll at multiple G-forces. My name is Will Braun. I'm the steering lead for Team Chippewa Performance here at CMU. Uh, some of the objectives for the whole steering process this year is to design and create uh, custom steering knuckles for the car switch to a custom steering rack and make it front steer and creative parallel steering geometry. Uh, we need to manufacturing the steering and improve our testing methods from prior years and of course then move on to test and verify this so we are ready for the race. Moving into the steering rack design, this year we now feature a custom steering rack as opposed to last year which we had an off-the-shelf stiletto model. It has a 1 to 4.7 ratio which will allow for quicker turns, reduced driver fatigue, and ease of use. It features an aluminum housing, which means it's easy for us to manufacture here in-house, and overall it is cheaper to make than buying a model. Uh, future changes, just from looking at it, I think there's room for improvement, so I'm going to continue to work on it. Uh, one thing I see potentially being done is including bearings into the whole design to allow for a stronger feel. Next we have the steering column. This has a large amount of improvements this year. We have two universal joints as opposed to one and bearing supports, two of them located spaced equally throughout the steering column. This will allow a more sturdier feel and smoother turns as there are less degrees of angle in each joint. This also makes it easier to remove each of the bearings that use a standard bearing collar so we can simply unscrew it. Last year's car did not have this and it was very hard to remove it, very time consuming. Also with these additional supports, I think it will be much stronger, less wobbly. And just from 
installing it in the car at the moment, I can already see improvements. Steering uprights this year are aluminum, simple, easy to make, light, and I allow for a full range of motion, all while incorporating a center joint for a CV axle. Uh, there is some couple FEA tests from the force experience during a front end crash and jump. It will both are expected to hold up well during the competition. Some other steering components we have. Uh, this is one that I've looked at towards and think one thing that I definitely think needs to be improved. So on the top is the whole design for the clevis. The major problem with this design is that it cannot rotate or be reused. What I say when I mean cannot rotate is that it is locked in place. As you can see, there are threads fixed directly to the clevis itself, so it is held in place. During the course of the race, due to vibrations and simply due to the nature of the tie rods and steering movement, it will tend to unscrew itself and be loose at the end of the race. So I needed a new design that would allow me to have a clevis that swivels to avoid these problems. The other problem is that it can't be reused. So if, say, during a crash, something hits the wheel, the force would travel through the tie rod and bend the clevis and threads on the end, making it junk, we can't reuse it, which is a waste of money. So the new design needed to incorporate a way that I could keep the clevis and switch out the threads if need be. So I came up with design number one in the middle, which is CNC milled and turned. It has a place where we can stick a bolt through it, standard hex head bolt which will allow it to both swivel and replace the bolt if necessary. And design number two, which is a little cheaper, a little less elegant, is made from existing parts that can be ordered online and does the exact same thing. Both of these fix the problems from the old design and I'm still working towards what will be better based on additional analysis. Next is the steering wheel. So the steering wheel is the driver's connection to the car, is where their hands go, it's their feel for the entire car and the driving experience. So this year we have a new shape for it. It is much more ergonomic and this is, comes from driver feedback based on the old steering wheel. It features 3D printed grips which are contoured to your hand and will be wrapped in a much softer material for additional comfort. So to validate my design for steering, of course we're gonna do this with testing on our track just to get see if there's any obvious problems or anything the driver notices. And that leads me to my second point. Driver input is one of the biggest focus points for me to validate the steering. So I'd like to see what they notice when it comes to vibrations. I am a little more concerned with vibrations this year as we have multiple mounts to the steering column. So I think vibrations may be transmitted more easily, which can be very taxing on the hands. And as well as ergonomics, is the steering wheel, steering column all placed in a comfortable position. Uh, forces and the limits of the steering system, I would like to verify with FE and CAD, find the limits and then find the real world testing with strain gauges and of course the overall functionality of the steering system. So I'm looking for maneuverability and ease of use. I would like to do this with a slalom course and test the ratio. As you know, we have a much faster ratio. I would like to see how this handles on a slalom course, simply set up with cones in a parking lot, just to see how the driver handles it. Hi, my name is Selena Lopez. I'm the Sears Brakes Lead. Some improvements from the previous years, we have our, our front calipers failed to lock consistently and our rear calipers were mounted on the transfer case, so that led to a lot of problems with consistent locking again. We lost a lot of brake force through our master cylinder mounting, there was a lot of torsion and bending going on, and our pedals every year have been made out of aluminum, and so they tend to deform throughout the season and get sort of a bend in them. Our first goal is that we now have independent braking on all four of our tires. We want them all to lock statically and dynamically. We have a safety factor greater than 1.3 this year. So this year we have dual master cylinders. We have the GS Compact master cylinder. They have integrated well reservoirs for ease of mounting. Because we have two master cylinders, we have a bias bar that I've implemented into equaling out our braking between the front and the rear. Our calipers this year are from Woolwood. Having floating calipers allows for uh, lower tolerances. The fix required um, really tight tolerances and leading to more issues, especially with braking, uh, locking. Our calipers this year have the largest single piston diameter in this size. Our calipers are all the same this year. They allow for interchangeability between the front and the rear in all four corners. Our calipers are mounted on our new hubs. They're mounted at the wheels this year and 
in previous years we had the front calipers mounted at the wheels but the rears mounted off the transfer case. The master cylinder is mounted in front of the pedal and our brake pedal is mounted horizontally. Here are some screenshots of what the brake pedal looks like mounted on the car. It's highlighted in orange, it's mounted horizontally. In the bottom corner you can also see the pedal mount support that we had to design in order to mount the brake pedal horizontally with the master cylinders mounted in front. Here is our brake calculator. Last spring a senior design group here at CMU through the Baja team put together a brake calculator in order to appropriately size our calipers and calculate our stopping distance. Here are some statistics that we have drawn from our calculator. Our max deceleration after the wheel lock was 25.76 feet per square, second squared. Our minimum stopping distance ended up being 16.7 feet. Um, and our weight transfer from the rear to the front upon stopping was 169.03 pounds. All these statistics are taken into account of the fifth percentile female exerting 90 pounds on the pedal. So in order to validate our braking, we have our static and dynamic lock testing, um, which is especially important this year to ensure that all four of the tires are locking in the same way. Our inline and brake line pressure gauge testing and just validating our calculator and our stopping distance on various surfaces along with our friction on various surfaces. Thanks again for watching. If you have any questions, please Feel free to reach out to any of the contacts listed over here. And if you want to learn more about our team, you can visit our website or any of our social medias.